8 tonight. That's where we'll begin at. We're going to read all the rest of the book tonight just because it's so interesting. It's tough, isn't it, to be in 1 Samuel and listen to a preacher? You know what I do? Uh, this is like one of my confessions, and I'm not asking your forgiveness for it because only God can forgive me if I, if I'm, if I really confess it. But uh, whenever somebody preaches from 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, I just sit there and read my Bible the whole time and don't pay attention to anything that they say because it's just so interesting. You know, it's just that story time. And it's, they're all true stories, real events, and they're just so thrilling and so inspiring. If you're a young man, uh, read First and Second Samuel. Learn courage. Courage is a lost. It's just, it's, it's just a lost virtue in the world. I'm just saying America. It's in the world. Men don't have courage. And we're right in the middle, actually, uh, or we're really beginning a part where we're going to see men with courage. That's men that have great courage. Saul, uh, we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, is a man who illustrates that good people can go bad. Good people can go bad. Saul was a courageous man. He was a good, courageous man. Jonathan is probably one of the best, most virtuous men that ever lived. That's my take, my opinion on it, but everything that I read about Jonathan, Saul's son, was just a courageous man. David, oh man, talk about a guy with some courage. A kid with courage. I mean, David would, <laughs> yeah, a bear comes and yeah, he kills the bear. Lion comes and tries to get his, I don't kill the lion. Giant comes, kill the giant. I mean, it's just, you know, it, David, why, what is it about you? Well, you know what, I know God. And, you know, God's a lot bigger than that, and God's with me. And so I'm not afraid of anything anywhere. We just need to learn some of that. Amen. We need courage. Uh, you know, I, I was reminded as we were singing this evening, all these songs about Jesus just thrill my heart. And I was reminded as, as the first song we opened with, I really talked about the hope that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And uh, the reality that Jesus is coming soon is a reminder that we win. We can't lose. Why in the world do winners lose heart? Now, have you ever, <clears throat> you ever just played something where you overmatched your opponents? You ever played a game? So I'm not talking about like you know I'm playing a five-year-old, I can beat them at basketball. So I'm talking about like you just, you just, you just are better, and you know you're better. And you overmatch your opponent in whatever you're playing or you're doing. I'll tell you something. The 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 whole way that you go about it is, it's it's just completely different, isn't it? Uh, sometimes because of that, people play down to their competition when it's a sporting event. But the reality of it is, is when you overmatch somebody, you're just not worried about anything they can do or they can bring. <laughs> if, if you hate the NFL, that's okay with me. I'll hate them right alongside you, okay? But uh, you know a couple years ago when the Patriots were playing the Falcons and they were down, was it 28-3 at the half? Brother Taj called me and he said, Pastor, my Falcons are up by 25 points. And I said, is it is uh, Tom Brady not able to score 25 points and a half? And that's what I said. And I honestly believe Tom Brady could do it. And guess what? The rest is history and all the memes will be on the internet forever. And so, <laughs> why, why you say, well, just, when you're just overmatched sometimes. Sometimes the individual just has confidence. Hey, folks, we won. It's done. Jesus Christ defeated death and sin. I'm amazed at how casually the revelation of Jesus Christ just summarizes the great war against evil. You know, like all the nations of the world come and surround the city of Jerusalem. Boom, God speaks, they're dead. <laughs> and then and the devil. You know, an angel comes and puts, you know, chains him up, throws him in the bottomless pit. An angel. God doesn't come, you know, and you know this epical bat battle with Satan. He sends an angel and lock him down. That's how close the battle is. God's never been threatened by any evil. He's never been in trouble. Good has never been uh, threatened. Good is God. God's never been overmatched, evenly matched. There's just nothing close to good, which is God. And, and so we as believers ought to have courage. So we're in a portion of Scripture. Like I said, I tend to just go off and start reading. And... Uh, don't do that tonight. You, you have all week long. You're allowed to read your Bible. There's nobody that stops you. you. It's not your only chance here in church Sunday night 
to read 1 Samuel chapter 8 and just take off and read. So stick with me. If I catch you reading your Bible while I'm preaching, I'm going to call you out. Okay? Verse, <laughs> verse 19 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. I like to say things that are ironic or funny sometimes. And that's one of them. So anyway. Nevertheless, the people are... Are you reading your Bible right now? I told you I was. All right. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Love that verse. And to just to meditate on it, I'm not going to preach it tonight, so you just think on it go back there. And not until we're done, okay, on your own time. The Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man into his city. Now go to chapter 12. Chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. Verse 16. <clears throat> now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and He shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great which he have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil, to ask us a king. So Father, I pray that this evening, as we look at this portion of the Scripture, that you would help us to glean from and understand some important truths about your character, who you are as God, our God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a good reminder when you're in a uh, historical part of the Bible, this would be one of the, uh, really the books of history in the Bible that give us the history of the nation of Israel, the forming of the nation of Israel, specifically where we're at historically, is in the passing over from Israel being a theocracy to being a monarchy. A theocracy being a rule by God alone, where God would use judges to deliver Israel or to judge them instead of a king. And so everybody in Israel would have been free before that. There would be no one who could levy taxes. There would be uh, only God that they were answerable to. It's not a bad statement, actually, in the judges when the Bible says uh, there was no king in Israel in those days. What does it say? Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. I'll be, well, I've heard so many sermons preached from that. No, it was just saying this is not in the time of a monarchy. This is a time when individuals answer to God for themselves. And it, what, that's not, that is not some kind of a negative statement about the way that Israel was ruled. That was God's preferred method at the time and in that day. Now, obviously there was a law in Israel, wasn't there? And God gave judges in Israel. So it's not like, you know, this is just anarchy. Anybody can do anything they like. But there was no king to uh, take your daughters and, and uh, make them his wives, to take your sons and make them his servants, and to in, uh, conscript your young men and make them his soldiers, and, and uh, to go off conquering and fighting wars and trying to build an empire and, and a kingdom and an heritage for himself. No, there was, everybody in Israel was free to live in the land of their inheritance, and that was God's best for them. Anytime we read in the book of history, in the Bible, a lot of times we're going to just get an account of this is what happened, these are the events. Perhaps there's the, you know, the spiritual perspective where you have a prophet and this is the message to a king or a message to the people. And when he gives the message to the people, uh, then there's usually an account of how the people responded or didn't respond or, or responded poorly. And sometimes the Scripture in historical books it just tells us what happened. Solomon had, what, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And so people go, well, you know, in the Bible, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and so polygamy is okay. No, it just tells us what happened. You know, the Bible's not saying it's okay. It's saying this is what he did. We know what the Bible says about it. There's plenty of Scripture about in the law about kings being like the heathen kings and taking to themselves wives. It's interesting, the law, before there was a king, that God said, you're not supposed to have a king. When you get a king, <laughs> that's what the law says. You're not supposed to have a king like the heathen nations. When you get a king, he better not marry a bunch of wives 
and be like the heathen kings, heathen nations. It's interesting how God knows the heart of men, isn't it? And a lot of things that are written in the Bible, people say, well, God's okay with it. Divorce is another one. You know, well, you know, the divorce is in the law uh, for the way. No, God was never okay with it. God knew what people were going to do, and He made a legal, legal requirement for the hardness of people's hearts. And so that doesn't... So when we're preaching the Word of God, how we apply the Word of God, when the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt or thou shalt not, that's a command. But sometimes when we study the Scripture, we're looking at an account, and we're actually just seeing a perspective. We're getting a temperature of the spiritual climate of the day, for instance. We're getting an account of how people were doing, and we're just told this is what they did. And this is the attitude that they had. And so when you preach from a portion of Scripture, you study a portion of Scripture like that, there are a couple of things that you want to do in order to understand and make good application for the Scripture. You know, it's easy when you go to, say, for instance, John chapter 13. Here's an illustration. When Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, so shall all men know that you are my disciples. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? The application for it, you're supposed to love one another. Believers are supposed to love each other, and that's a way that people can know uh, that you're following Jesus. Well, that's a pretty good commandment, isn't it? Uh, sometimes in account of the Scripture, though, that isn't the way that it's taught. In other words, we just see what God said, we see how people responded, and then we see what God did. And then we can look at that and we can understand God's heart because God's unchanging. That's a passage like what we saw this evening. You guys see it when we read? Now stop looking at your Bibles. Now we already read the Bible. We're going to read some more in a little bit, but you stay out of there. For right now, we're going to make some application here. So the story, the account that we read this evening uh, was that... Samuel rehearsed before the Lord everything that the people had said to him. In other words, he went and told God what God already knew. I like the, I like the, I like the word, don't you, rehearsed? Isn't that an excellent word to describe it? Because what do you do when you rehearse? Repeat. Repeat the same thing over and over again. Right? Just the same thing over and over and over again. I can just imagine. Can you just see Samuel? Uh, I don't see Samuel's like hair, I see him in a robe, you know, and it's a brown robe, and he's, he's, he's tall, and uh, he's walking in the temple, that's what I see, and I see Samuel pacing, and I see him, you know, walking and just telling God over and over, God, you, these dirty, rotten people, all you've done for them, you've sent them judges and delivers, and God, I just can't believe that these people would, would reject you like this, and they reject me. You know, I didn't make me high priest. You made me high priest. So when they reject me, they're rejecting you. You said that. That's what you told me. God, you know, I, you know, you. I remember you said that. You know, told Moses that one time. Remember what you said about I'm just going to wipe them all out and make a nation out of you. Uh, God, find somebody, some decent person, to make a nation. I just wipe these people out. They're no good. I can just see him going all around and rehearsing and talking over with the Lord and having his private conversation. Samuel is. And God's just real direct with them. Hey, Samuel, just, just go along with this right now. And when you read that part, if you stop there, you get the impression that, you know, well, there's just not much God can do about these people that are just so wicked. I mean, they're just going to do what they're going to do, and God's just going to have to go along with it because, I mean, what's He going to do? You know. But then we read the rest of the story. God gives them Saul. We're going to see that we're going to begin looking at Saul. We're going to look at uh, good people gone bad. We're going to start looking at next week. God gives them Saul, and the first thing Saul does is God uses him to deliver them. Some people had said, we don't want Saul to be our king. We don't think, you know, these Benjamites will think they're really great guys. And we don't want Saul to be our king. And then Saul, I mean, he, he delivers them from a real bad thing. You know, we just let, you know, pop your eye out and and you can be our slaves and we'll let you live. You know, that kind of a scenario. That doesn't sound very good. I mean, I'll let your eye popped out and you're allowed to live. Saul, de Saul delivers them as a nation. And then the men from, uh, the men, uh, from Benjamin said, who are the people that said they don't want Saul to be our king? Let's put him to death. And now Saul's been instated. He's the king of Israel. And... and then all of a sudden, everything's, everything's like, well, now we got our king. We got what we want, and he's a good one. We got a good king. And you think that's the end of the story. Now we're going to talk about the monarchy in Israel. But no, we get into our text to see. Let's read that again. Um, now, in, in uh, 
chapter 12, God is giving a message. Um, and, it, and it really begins in, in verse 12 of chapter 12. When you saw that the Nahash, the uh, king of Israel, or the, uh, the king of the children of Ammon came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. And when the, when the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, behold the king whom you've chosen, whom you've desired, and behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. Well, okay, good. If you'll serve the Lord, or fear the Lord, and serve him, and obey his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. Now God goes ahead and lets them know something. Okay, you guys wanted a king for your nation. I have a plan that supersedes national Israel. It supersedes your generation. What was God's plan for the nation of Israel? What's the culmination of God's plan for the nation of Israel? The Messiah to come. Yeah, for us to have a Messiah. You think God's going to let Israel wanting an earthly king and rejecting him as their ruler to come in the way of that plan? No. Not at all. And so here, here's just something God reminds them about. You wanted a king, and I gave you a king. The Lord gave you a king. Capital L-O-R-D. The Lord. Jehovah God gave you the king you wanted. Now you got that king and you still got me. I'm still God. He's a king, I'm God. And you have to hearken to me. You have to listen to me. <laughs> How many of y'all want an extra supervisor? You know? That's what it's like asking for, isn't it? I mean, you got the boss, and uh, you know, you're working directly with the boss, and then he gives you a supervisor. That's not a good situation, is it? All a supervisor is is a barrier between you and the boss. There's somebody that you have to answer to instead of getting answers a lot of times. So these people say, well, we want a king. And God said, well, you're going to get a king and you get me. <laughs> now, a lot of times when individuals have a problem, their problem, what was their problem? Was it that God had never delivered the nation of Israel? The judges couldn't do it? I mean, Samson, you know, that's just too weak. You know, we need somebody. Was that the problem? No, the problem was rebellion, actually. The problem was a heart that said, you know, God, I'd a lot rather answer to a man. I see it all the time. Uh, young people do this all the time, and adults do this all the time. They try to figure a way to not answer to the final authority. They try to figure out a way, if you tell them to do something, to get around it by asking somebody else. And this is all they're doing. They're saying, well, God, give us a king, and then we don't have to listen to you because we'll listen to him. And God said, you're going to listen to him, you're going to listen to me. You get, you get a real authority and then you get a king. <laughs> Great. Uh, and now, God gives them some more good news. Verse 15, If you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. And God said the consequences will be the same. You think you can rebel against the king and all you'll answer to is a king. No, you rebel against me and you still will have to answer to me. This is a reminder that God is the judge of all living. He's not made to be God by anybody. He is God because that's who He is. And so acknowledging or not acknowledging Him or setting up an alternative smaller God that you feel more comfortable because He's more limited than supreme God in heaven, it just doesn't work that way. He's still God. There are many individuals that are so delusional that they believe that not acknowledging the existence of God will be a way that they can avoid judgment. just doesn't work. He's still God, whether you're delusional or not. Uh, there are individuals who think, well, you know what, I worship this religion. And they play that every religion is valid. We just, just should, you know, we should just be accepting of different beliefs. If people are, as long as they're sincere in their religion, then it's valid. And they play that game, the valid religion, any valid religion game. God's still God, and He's not concerned about religion. And so God is reminding the children of Israel, you can have all your silly little games. You can, if you make the choice, you can have all the consequences of rebelling against me, but I'm still God. I'm still God. Friend, don't make the mistake the children of Israel made of playing games about trying to get out from under God's authority. It will not work. He's still God. 
and he's still the authority. And so God gives them a sign through Samuel. I like this one. Uh, now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Verse 17. Is it not wheat harvest today? I'll call upon the Lord. Now, how would you like this? Wheat harvest. Any of you farmer types. I will call on the Lord and he shall send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel said, Okay, God! Call on the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Yeah, God gave you a king. Oh, He kept you uh, from being conquered. God's still God. A king can't deliver you. God can. And a king may judge you in a way that a man can, but God's still God, and you rebelled against Him. And God sent thunder and rain during harvest. What's that do for harvest when it thunders and rains? At, at the very least, it does great damage to the crops. And God sent a judgment to them. And I mean, <laughs> you ever been in a storm where you're like, I wonder if God's mad? You ever been in a storm where I mean, just like, boom! You know, you it, it, it doesn't just begin to storm. It just, it's like the sky just falls and the thunder roars and it just rip roaring. I love storms myself. I enjoy a good storm. Being in, when I'm in the right place, you know, in a place where there are low percentage chances of being burned to a crisp by lightning and things. And I, I enjoy being out in a storm. I love sitting on a car in a storm, just having the thing just let loose and having just break over me. I like that. But uh, when you know God sent the same, you say, God's going to send a real storm today. And I imagine it was a doozy. It was enough that everybody said, <laughs> boy, 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 we've been bad and we're in a lot of trouble. That was the idea. So they came to Samuel. Now this is a mess, isn't it? You asked for a king, you got a king, and now God said, I'm mad at you for getting a king, and He starts to judge you. Okay, again, God is not wringing His hands. He's not saying, what am I going to do? These people don't want me to be their king. What's going to happen with my plan of redemption? What am I going to do? No, God said, I'm going to let you guys know how it's going to be. He's still God. I find a great deal of comfort in knowing God's always on the throne, don't you? Mm -hmm. A lot of comfort in knowing God's always in control and He's always God. And people can rebel and they can do what they, uh, what God allows them to do. But God's going to let them know. No one gets away with anything. So, in verse 19, all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we've added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And so what happens? Well, the people repented. They said, we've been bad. Not only did we not want God to rule over us, on top of that, we've added to our sins by asking a king. Now this is a mess, isn't it? This is really a typical pattern for sin. You're a child of God's, and God's very, very clear about the way a believer ought to live. And you make the determination, I'm not going to live God's way, and so you go out and you get into sin. And when uh, sin has its way with you, you think you're having your way with it, but when it has its way with you, all of a sudden, it's judgment time, and you realize, man, I messed up. You know, God's a merciful God. You go to God and you say, God, man, I, everything I did was wrong. I was wrong about the way that I approached it, the way I handled it, I was wrong the direction I went, I was wrong with for what I did. What I did was terrible. God, I'm asking your forgiveness. And I just want you to know, God's a very merciful God. He's a God that says, yeah, I know you're wrong. And yeah, you know what? The reason I gave you consequences is because I love you and I want you to get right. Now you got a king. Sometimes believers just think God's just going to wave a magic wand and all the things that you created are just going to vanish into smoke. God says, yeah, you've been bad. Now you got a king. He's a good looking one. He's a tall one. He's a tough one. Well, we could write a, uh, a uh, Beauty and the Beast kind of a song out of this one. Too bad I can watch Beauty and the Beast. I can put this to words. <laughs> King Saul. I mean, look at the guy. You got him. You asked for him. God didn't say, okay, Saul's going to go home now and we're all going to forget this ever happened. That's not what he said. Here's what he said. Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord. 
but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn you not aside. For then should you go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they're vain. So don't get sidetracked. Don't just say, well, it's over, it's ruined. I'm just going to go live for nothing. No. The Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake. That is one of my favorite quotes in all the Bible. Because there's nothing about the people that keeps them from being God forsaken. It's everything about God that keeps them from being God forsaken. And that's the way it started to begin with. You know, there's no reason God's interested you know, in us. If you think that uh, really being sincere or really working hard is what impresses God, no, my friend, God doesn't love you ever because of how wonderful you are. And I find a great deal of comfort in that because I'm pretty, I'm pretty well aware of how wonderful I am not. Nobody's wonderful. And God said, for my great name's sake. You always <laughs> listen, go ahead and be a low life and, and go for that, you know, that uh, uh, crooked appeal, if you will. That rough appeal. Like, well, God, for your great name's sake. <laughs> you know what? That's that's valid for God. So it's truth. God, God, you're good and I'm not. Remember that? God, I'm lousy, but you're good. The only reason I'm asking is because you're good. You say, Pastor, that is just low down. That is just sneaky. That you know, no person ought to ought to just be forgiven just because God's good. Well, if you want to take that case, no one will be forgiven. If that were so, the only reason anybody's ever forgiven is because God's good. That's it. Man, I tell you, this is a thriller, isn't it? Isn't this a wonderful verse? The Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it hath to please the Lord to make you a people. Now, isn't this incredible? we got a perspective of the hearts of the children of Israel, the wrong that they've done, how they've rejected God and rejected Samuel. They rejected Samuel, really rejected God. They got their king. It seemed like God's okay with it. It turns out God's not okay with it. He's still going to be their God. But because of His great name's sake, He's still going to be their Lord, and it has pleased the Lord to make you His people. Now, explain that any other way than that God is just gracious and merciful. Explain that any other way than that God is just gracious and merciful. You see what we're talking about when we take application from a story? Look at what happened. Here's what the people did. Here's what God thought. Here's what God said. And when God said this, here's what we learn about God. My friend, I've learned this evening that God is gracious and merciful. How about you? It pleased the Lord to make you a people. Moreover, as for me, Samuel said, and here, here's, here's my take on it. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I'll teach you the good and right way. Samuel said, I'm still going to do right by you too. Can you imagine you reject Samuel. Man, you talk about it in your face. We don't want you Samuel rejecting him by wanting a king. We talked about last week how the children of Israel should have responded when Samuel's sons were no good. They responded the wrong way. And now Samuel's response to them is, God forbid that I should stop or I should cease. Sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you. But I'll teach you the good and right way. Samuel said, I'm still going to I'm still going to fulfill my duty to the Lord. I'm going to do right by you. Still. And here we find a good human example. Now we find that God is gracious and merciful. Anthony, come come, come uh, to where we're at, okay? You here? Alright, sit up straight. No? Alright. Sit up all the way. Just sit up all the way. Sit back. Sit back in your seat. Alright? You ready? Alright, we're going to continue now. Alright. So God forbid that I should see sin against the Lord and seizing to pray for you, but I'll teach you the good and right way. And then he said, You only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. And here we find an appeal from the standpoint of God's goodness. You know, this is summarized in Jude, isn't it? Of some have compassion making a difference. And others safe by fear, pulling them out, hating you in the garments spotted by the flesh. 
You know, God wants to be compassionate if you let Him. He's a compassionate, merciful God. You ought to rush to the throne of mercy. You ought to just run there. Now to say, you know what, I sin. By rights, I should be dead. I'm not. And since I'm not, I'm going to go get forgiveness. Just run there. You know, it's, it's interesting to look at, at the mercy places in, the, in, in, in national Israel where you could go and grab a hold of the horns on the altar and you couldn't be put to death there. You could plead for your life. It's a picture of the way it is in heaven. You can go and just grab a hold of, just fall before God in His throne and plead the blood of Jesus Christ on your behalf. God, Jesus died for this. It's terrible. It's, it's, it should be unpardonable, but for the blood of Jesus. Last one. All right? I'm almost done. I would be done. But you're distracted and it's, it's not okay. Knock it off. All right. Now, but for the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat. Man, we don't deserve anything, do we? We don't deserve forgiveness. But my friend, I'm here to tell you, based on this example in the Word of God, that God in His character has always been a gracious, good, and merciful God. And that's on the basis of His character, not yours or mine. And that's a good thing. And so then the final verse in our text this evening, uh, Samuel said, But if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both ye and your king. God's not playing. We're playing games. It's, it's for real. He's, he's not helpless. You don't have Him in a situation where... Well, God, you know, the situation is Samuel's sons are no good and you can't make anything out of that, so you're going to have to give us a king just like we want. I said, I'll give you a king. And I'm still God. And Samuel's still my representative right now. And all we see in it by, based on the character of God is grace and mercy. It's not new with God, is it? It's always been that way. Do you know Him that way? you know God that way? Do you know that when you sin, the accuser of the brethren always says to you, you're unpardonable? Look at what you've done. You're so wicked, you don't ever deserve to be forgiven. He always tells you that, doesn't He? He tells you how good God's been, how terrible you've been, and then He tries to get you to draw the bad conclusion, the wrong conclusion, that because God's good and you're bad, that a good God would be inconsistent with His own character. God's always good. It's always good, always has been. And friend, you can count on it. And you can always just run to Him. And you can have forgiveness. doesn't mean you won't still have a king that you went and got yourself. You know? Man, I shouldn't have gone out and gotten debt. you still got to pay your bills. Well, I shouldn't have gone and done that. Got in that relationship where well, you still got to be wrecked by people. But God will forgive you. God will pardon you. God will make something great out of you in spite of what you are. Because He's that kind of God. Father, we rejoice in having a God like you to rule and to reign over us. God, thank you for your perfect plan and for using imperfect people, which is such an encouragement to people like ourselves. We just ask that you would remind us about these truths this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you're dismissed. What?